Great to have so many of you on the call this evening. And as you can see, the focus of our webinar is how we will effectively manage player behaviour to enable a positive football experience for all. Tell us a little bit about uh, your prior or your current strategies. Um, yeah, I mean, I can tell you something I'm currently working on um, with uh, my son's team. Um, we've um, we've got a fairly new team that um, haven't played regularly together. And I think when we talk about managing behaviour, we automatically think about the good and the bad. Um, however, we're in a situation where it's not necessarily good or bad. It's we're we're, we're suffering um, some heavy defeats week in week out, and it's how do we manage the behaviour there to help keep them going, to help keep them motivated. So at the moment, I'm trying to work with the boys to help them realise that, yeah, I know the results aren't, aren't nice and we don't like losing, but let's look at the process of what we're going through in terms of learning, helping them realise that there's some really good stuff that they're doing within within the game. Um, and it, we're doing it against good opposition so that they should take some positives from that. Even though we're losing the games, it's actually you're still doing some really good stuff. So I think, we're, yeah, just trying to shift that that mentality from results focused to that process focused. Um, and the message is slowly getting there, but um, I think it's going to be, it's going to take a bit of time. Uh, we, in the last uh, season and a half or so, we've introduced match day awards. So no matter what the outcome, you just talked there about results and scoreline. Uh, ours is very much based on the performance and we have a player of the match, but we also have a moment of the match. And that's something that I've really trialled in the last 18 months to actually, as well as the coaches selecting perhaps the player of the match this week, the parents would actually select the moment of the match. So again, all decide to have that positivity, first and foremost for the young players, but also for the parents to have some involvement as well. I like that moment of the match. And I like how you're engaging the parents in that as well to do that. It gives them something to focus on. Um, and I think I'm probably going to steal it now to, to implement with my, my son's team. Again, they ask one of the players to pick something out to praise that someone else did. So they're engaging in the players to start looking at um, what they've done well. Um, and I think that's actually really effective because I, I've noticed I've never prompted it with 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 my players, but they do they do do it a lot. Like, oh, did you see that? And did you see what he did there? And did you see the save he made? And you know, I think doing doing things like that can really, really motivate them and, and really help, you know, keep them engaged, keep them going. So, yeah, right. I love that. And I've just seen flying through on the chat there that somebody talked about having an award for the, the best trainer of the week. So that youngster, that young player, that older player perhaps who comes along and actually works very, very hard and has a great attitude within practice sessions. Uh, and as well, we're seeing uh, our coaching colleagues who join us tonight talking about their working with older players. So examples, as always, we said earlier, the context is crucial. Yeah. It's about catching them in as opposed to catching them out, really shining a light on the positive stuff because it's very, very easy. We are hardwired as the human race to go to the negative first. Yeah, that's all part of our evolution. Uh, if anybody actually does any delving into the whole uh, development of the human race, uh, the, the the fight or flight concept. So negative reactions to situations that we had, obviously, as primitive man, if you like. So not turning this into a history lesson. Um, but the matter of the fact is, if we can always just try and focus on the positive things, and that's not to ignore at times poor behaviour where things might need to be corrected. But yeah, catching them in rather than catching them out, Chris, is the, the mantra that I like to use. Great stuff. Um so we're going to go on, move on to our first theme, really, of, of the evening. And it's great that Vinny's touched upon many of his grassroots beliefs uh, and, and philosophies. And it's that importance of knowing yourself. What is it about this this particular topic, knowing yourself, that that is important? For me, I, I'm going to keep this really, really simple. Because I say I've been doing what I do now, James, for, for over 30 years. And I personally do have a real clarity of my own why. Why do I do what I do? What gets me out of bed to, to do the job that I do? Obviously, like yourself, we're, we're honoured and we're privileged to work for the Football Association. Um, 
But either way, you know, let's talk about our roles within grassroots coaching. Why do we do what we do? Uh, mine is actually framed around my surname. And this has taken a few years to, to actually, for me to really pin down, okay, is that what my raison d'etre is, if you like? So as you know, James, my surname is Whole Soul. So for the guys on the call tonight, for me, that represents healthy, active lifestyles and lifelong learning. And everything I do, so let's bring it into the football context, I want my youngsters to be really active. When they come to a practice session, yeah, be really active. So I will design sessions where there's lots of activity time, lots of ball rolling time. On match days, they are there to get game time. So that blends into my match day perspective in terms of a positive experience. The youngsters need to have game time. Now, at under 15 age group, that's not necessarily equal game time every game, but that will be equal game time or as close as you can over a series of games. And then that lifelong learning, uh, I just work really hard, and this is my teaching background, to ensure that there's some learning that happens in every practice session on every match day. Now, of course, you might dial it up and dial it down for certain individuals within your group. But I think it's really important that that learning piece happens. And it doesn't always need to be explicit learning. It might be the implicit learning by virtue of the fact that you've got a practice session this week that, in effect, you copy the week after. And there might not be a lot of intervention from you in terms of whole group coaching, but you might be going around just working with individuals to help and to support. Uh, I've got a question in the, the group here from uh, from Sophie. Uh, so Sophie Coyne, I will get around to answering that in a moment. I'll type in. Um, but it's all about meeting the needs of all players, no matter what context you're working in. So whether you're working with a typical under-15 group that I'm working with, or in Sophie's case, whether you're working with a disability group. So it's being able to interact with all of those individuals to bring that learning to life. And something I've realised recently, um, because... You know, I can preach all the stuff that you can do as uh, in terms of behavior management, but me interacting with my boys, um, yeah. I have realized that um, I can go, when I'm hungry or I'm tired, I can go from zero to 10 very, very quickly. And before you know it, I'm already shouting at the, at, at the boys. And what I've noticed is they've actually started doing it as well. They're now, shout, they're now shouting back. And... Um, I think we've got to be really, really mindful and start to really think about us as people in terms of how we react in certain moments because um, the behaviours we portray are the behaviours eventually that the, the kids will portray, portray as well. And we've, we've heard it before around respecting referees, for example, and what the kids see on the, on, on the Premier League and everything, but it really hit home for me seeing my boy starting to behave the way I behave in certain moments. So I think if we can start to be a little bit more self-reflective on ourselves and our behaviour, um, and that will link to the reasons and the motivations as to why you're there. But I think we need to start with ourselves and start thinking about that. And you can actually see that as well with the parents. Um, and this is more probably targeted towards youth level, but the parents and, and their behaviours and how they can then have that impact. Do, are they aware of not just some of the, the negative behaviours that you might describe, but also some of the positives we think for example, that them praising on the sidelines and cheering is a good thing. But are we aware that actually that might raise the arousal levels of the children that are playing? And before you know it, they're now not just excited, they're anxious and their performances can start to dip. So can we as a team, as a club, can we become a bit more aware of our own behaviours and how they will impact on other people? example now so we frame ours around the four letters uh, of the name of our club e s f c and the four words are enjoyment sportsmanship friendship and the c used to be community so a bit more of a holistic approach to what we do uh, we've changed that recently to challenge and the reason we changed it is that we wanted to, that word challenge represents a number of things. First and foremost, we want to give the children, the young players, the teenage players, the adults, the right pathway. So the right level of challenge for where they're at, because they're going to be at different uh, uh, stages, as we know, in terms of their development. 
that mantra comes to mind that your best seven-year-old isn't always your best 17-year-old, isn't always your best 27-year-old. So actually matching up that idea of challenge for the players, the challenge for the coaches as well. So coaches, uh, and for those of us who are volunteer, volunteer coaches, I appreciate we'll have some career coaches uh, on the call tonight. But we need to have a challenge as well. That's healthy to keep us progressing in terms of things that we can improve on. And of course, the other aspect of challenge is what we talked about earlier, is maybe challenging those behaviours that we see perhaps from our players, but certainly we'll see from the spectators, from the parents. Uh, so obviously aligning that to the uh, the respect agenda as well. Uh, and we have a very simple mantra and it goes person before player. Uh, if we can actually get to know our young players, our teenagers, our adult players uh, in terms of what makes them tick, what motivates them, then that really is going to benefit uh, our coaching landscape. And as we keep talking about tonight, create as positive a football experience as possible. How do we support them? Um, I think as a coach, you've always got to be there to support the person, think about the person, um, and then improving them as a player it b becomes um, not secondary to a degree, but I think if a player feels that you respect them and you want to help them, then they're more likely to listen to you and, and follow you. Um, and essentially, they're, they're great lads. They really are. Uh, always engaged, keen to learn. But at the end of the day, they are teenagers. So let's consider this one. Um, you're doing a session. Uh, you're in the midst of your coaching. And actually 14 of your 16 players are actually performing really, really well and are very, very focused if you're doing some small group interaction with them. Uh, and it, it's really good. Uh, and you notice the two players, if you like, are off task. And it's that situation around my advice there would be the vast majority of the group are working very, very well. Um, so there's a piece to be said around tactically ignoring what might deem to be that poor behaviour. Because ultimately, we've got so much positive behaviour going on from the vast majority of the group. So do consider that now and again to tactically ignore a behaviour. And it might be those two individuals you pick up a conversation just a little bit later on to say that you've actually noticed something um, five minutes ago and, you know, are the boys OK, et cetera, et cetera. Because there might be all sorts of reasons uh, why they're not quite on task at that moment in time. Can you talk us through some um, strategies that you have on the pitch with players to help them to become more skillful? Well, first of all, I'm trying to connect with players. Um, so you can, uh, when you connect, you start a conversation, you, you learn more about each other. Uh, then you have a, a football plan and from out this football plan, you start your strategies and also your training sessions. And then we go on the pitch and what we hope is that when we have our plan and we all agree on it, there's lots of involvement and commitment and that then players um, start to, um, to work on that and taking responsibility for their actions uh, and get more and more independent from a coach. So a nice piece there from Serena uh, talking about the importance of connection and uh, another mantra for you guys hopefully to take away and to put into action because it's at the end of the day they are words but how do you apply it is the idea of connection before correction so said earlier it's really important that we can try and catch our players in rather than catch them out can we shine a light on their positive behaviors their positive performance their positive conduct their positive fair play it could be any aspect of what they're doing rather than simply going straight away to correcting uh, what we might deem to be uh, a not so good uh, technical pass, uh, maybe a little bit of poor decision making, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's a really powerful, powerful clip that everybody's just watched in terms of getting to know your players, having those conversations. You know, I, I think it's really powerful to have that chat early on in your sessions. Grassroots, I coach uh, a team of under 14s. That first five, ten minutes of the session, lots of small-sided games. They're just playing that unstructured play. And it's really important to find out uh, how the boys are, how the day's been at school, uh, how's life in general, what, they, what they're looking forward to in terms of the session. 
you know, is, is there anything going on in the background that you perhaps need to know about if they're not the normal cells? So I think it's really important that first five, 10 minutes, just to find out about your players, find out, you know, what kind of mood they're in, et cetera. Give ownership to the players on how they on how they see and how they're going to act in terms of the, the team values, the team beliefs. Um, so I had a scenario where uh, the, the team of players, they were technically and tactically good players, but they somewhat struggled with the social and the psychological element of it. So we got the players to come up with their own team ethics, their own team values, their own standards. So we're playing a game and one by one, they came off and had that conversation. We wrote them, we wrote them on the board, uh, on a whiteboard, and that sort of gave the team sort of ownership of what we expect in relation to training and on a match day, how they're going to behave, what they should expect from one another. So if you give the players ownership and they take ownership of those behaviours and values, I think they take more ownership of themselves and, the, and they follow that through. For me, the, f the first thing is getting them started quickly. So um, from a physical education perspective, I've seen a lot of, of, of uh, lessons that just take forever to get started. And then that's when you start to have uh, issues around behavior. So if we can get, get the games going, like Vinny, you mentioned earlier on, it's maybe starting with a match. So things like that for me. Um, quick starter activities to get them engaged, get them moving, and then um, you know building your session from there. I think that's that's my first go-to question that's come through, and I think it's quite relevant here to how uh, we can develop a coaching environment around. Um, it's come from Reese around tweaking your sessions when you've got different concentration levels and stuff. Um, I think one thing to mention there is the the, the types of games that we do. Um, we often run like a whole session where everyone does the same thing, which means that when we stop it, everyone stops. Can we start having smaller sessions, 3v3s like Vinny's mentioned, um, where when we go in and intervene, you're not stopping everybody. You can go in and you can talk to that particular group whilst the rest of them are playing. And then if you know one particular group doesn't like or struggles to follow instructions, maybe it's a, a, a 10 second challenge or something like that where you then get, you get in, you get out. Yeah, that's that's definitely something I've been working on, James. That the the power of those one to one conversations and those just little walking around and having conversations about anything to do with that FA four corner model. Really, a lot of power in one to one conversations. And we're going to play. It's called three two one. It's all about relationship building. It's all about being aware of others. It's about doing the greater thing for your team. So we're just playing small sided game. Three two one. When you score, you come over and you write your value on. Everybody happy? Playing to the blue lines. Same setup with the goal. Three bibs over the corners. We will, we will swap half time so the yellows have the uh, the privilege of shooting the other way. Right. So you scored. So have a think about your number one value that you want your teammates. Just anywhere, anywhere, anywhere over there. Getting your neatest writing out as well, aren't you? Love that. Hard work, fantastic. What's about at the very, very start about relationship building? Love what we've put on here, all right? If you do all these and display all these during the season, you will not go far wrong. Plus, it'll make you better people off the pitch as well. Chris, just, just tell us, what was your initial outcome or thinking when you were designing that game and, and, the, and, and the tasks that you imposed upon the players? So the game itself was a, a was a game called three two one, which you'll be able to see on the England Football Learning website, etc. Uh, in terms of the game itself, three two one, that's to encourage players to include other people. So as soon as you score one goal, it was worth three, and then it was worth two, and then it was worth one. So it's a nice way of uh, including all your players and not having that one or two players who dominate the game. But the real main aim of the session, uh, it was my first session with the Clifton Academy. Uh, group that was at the start of the season so it was really to install those uh, beliefs those values those standards that the players can expect of themselves so if you notice every time they scored they came over to the whiteboard and they wrote something that they'd expect of themselves but also their teammates so like I was talking about before it was about those players taking ownership of what they expect 
uh, for the rest of the season. And as you can see, they come up with some great answers. The kids, they know how they should be behaving. But if they take charge of it, in my experience, they're more likely to um, follow it.